there is no like writing I'm going to do for today's lecture. So this is week six, lecture one. So today we're going to finish the um, uh, software interface in the sense here is our hardware. So what we had is we had the VDA, video VGA controller. And of course we had SDRAM. Okay. So we used the university program clock, if you will. So here is the pin connection. So we use the university program clock. And my refresh rate is messed up. So let's look at this again. All right. So we use the university program clock for SDRAM clock, okay? And also, oh yeah, something um, interesting, it's not, something about your DE1 board. Your um, DAC on the DE1 for the video interface does it doesn't really have a chip okay so this external clock doesn't really like go anywhere let's say you're using the de2 then you need this but um, i just sent it to an led so on the board if your nios processor is running properly then you will see this or your nios subsystem sorry is functioning you'll just see this led like barely lit because it's 25 megahertz you really can't see it turn on and off so anyway uh, that's about it for the hardware part, very straightforward. Now the software part, as we discussed last time, is we stopped at, I believe, this uh, opening the character buffer, okay? And then writing something to it using the how. So here it is, right? So here is the init. So I clear the buffer and I write something uh, to the buffer, okay, at these coordinates, X and Y. That's about it. So any questions so far on this? So for all of you who have sent the proposals, I've looked at all of them. A couple of them came in late, that's fine. So I've looked at that as well. It all looks good, right? So I sent you suggestions on how to get started, what to do. So, and a good point was raised. Apparently, like, there are, there's the D0 and the D0 Nano, yes? So the D0 Nano is for sale. Okay, so uh, for that, so the solution, if you want, uh, basically if you're using the, um, if you need to use the accelerometer or the ADC, the, okay, primarily if you want to use the accelerometer, I just realized that if, um, you know, if you want to use an ADC, you can use the audio codec line in on your DE1, okay? For an analog to digital converter is that clear you could do that but let's say you want to use an accelerometer your d0 doesn't have it so what has it is d0 nano okay if you want to buy it uh see there you have you heard of this local company aero electronics so they're out in brookfield it's available for 79 bucks okay i think uh, the tech support charges 50 bucks so of course it's cheaper, but uh, let's see. I don't know if you can buy it from the tech support because it's for CE majors, okay? But let's say you really need to use the accelerometer, then I would recommend you get the D0 Nano, either from tech support or buy it from Arrow. Or if you don't want to spend 80 bucks or 50 bucks, which is fine, uh, that is you don't want to spend it, then just uh, think about something, uh, think about a different project. Is that clear? It's only for folks who are planning to use an accelerometer. Like you could interface an external accelerometer to the DE1 board. So talk to me about that as well. Like I think in the tech support, they have ADXL 330s, right? I'm not sure what they, if they have ADXL 330s. Let's see. The problem is it's a um, SOIC package. So what they probably have is a breakout board like this. So if you look at this ADXL330, so let's say you really want to interface an accelerometer, you can go to tech support and ask them what kind of accelerometers they have. Uh, what you need is some ac some accelerometer that works at 3.6, 3.3 volts, all right? If you have an accelerometer that works at five volts, that won't, you can't interface that to the DE1. In the sense, you need like level shifters and that's a lot of work. So again, this for people who are only working with the accelerometer. Right? If you're doing the ADC, you really don't need the DE0 Nano. I just realized it, or the DE0, okay? Because you can use the audio codec line in. 
So that's pretty much the kind of the only announcement I had. So any other any questions? Okay. So now today what we're going to discuss is we're going to look at uh, this ISR, okay, interrupt service routine. So where I left out last time was we said that there are three steps to interfacing the to, to programming an interrupt on the NIOS 2 processor. You have to register the IRQ with the interrupt controller. You have to enable the IRQ and you have to code the ISR. Okay. So how do you register the IRQ this way? Right. Timer IRQ interrupt controller ID. So you use this function alt IC underscore ISR underscore register. So to actually find out all information about this, you can look at the uh, NIOS software programmer. I think it's the manual. Let's see. Software developers handbook. Okay. So I don't know if this is the latest version, but you can look at this. And let's see, software developers handbook. Uh, and hopefully, let's see if they have some information on interrupts. So they have information pretty much on everything, getting started from the command line, etc. Software build tools. Uh, so hardware abstraction layer. This is what we want. Okay, we're using the HAL, and let's see if we can find the information that we need. Uh, so for example, let's say you're using timer devices. There is information on like how to utilize the timer device, okay? Uh, let's see, there is uh, using interrupt controllers. So if you click on that, it'll hyperlink uh, to a different part of the software developer's handbook. So say PDF, blah, blah, blah. So exception handling, here it is. So it talks about what are the different kinds of like exceptions, there's hardware interrupt, there is, um, let's see, Exceptions, let's, let's see, interrupt controllers, external interrupt controllers. So anyway, all the information you need is in here. What I've done is I've distilled this information and I've given you the reference design and that's how you wanna understand how to design for digital systems. Okay, you understand the hardware and then you've got reference designs. So the first thing we do is we use this function, alt IC underscore ISR register, okay? So we give it the interrupt controller ID as the first argument. The actual IRQ, uh, let me type this in here, that, uh, oops, don't need that. Uh, that documentation all does, uh, can be found through the NIOS software developers handbook, uh, timer IRQ interrupt controller ID and other preprocessor directives can be found in system.h once the BSP is generated, okay, in Eclipse. And of course, these will change depending on how you name your components. I named my component timer, so it's called timer underscore IRQ. So it is. And of course, you really don't want to, this IRQ number, remember, is zero. You don't want to use this. Because you might go, and that is, you don't want to just hard code the constants for obvious reasons. That you might go into your um, QSYS and change the number. Right? So of course, it's always good practice. So these two are very straightforward. The third argument is also very straightforward in, in the sense: this is the name of your interrupt service routine. Just pass it in. Right? And here is the interrupt service routine. So the way you pass in uh, so notice that uh, the name of the ISR is char, char underscore buffer underscore fall, okay? And this will get triggered every uh, time the counter overflows, which is equal to the period of your interrupt I specified, which is one millisecond, okay? Which I specified in QSYS, in hardware. Remember I told you last lecture that you can have multiple timers, right? It's just add another timer unit. Okay, as long as you can make sure, of course, you're going to have different priorities. The number with the lower priority, the, uh, the smaller number has the higher priority, sorry. So uh, let's say you had a one millisecond uh, timer and a one second timer, okay? Every thousand interrupts of the one millisecond timer, you must have a priority resolution with the one second timer. Yes? Make sense? 
So in that case, what will run is the timer with the, what will what will get triggered first is the timer with the lower IRQ number. Make sense? Of course, you don't have to worry about uh, the priorities if they're, if they're not integer multiples of each other. That is, they'll never um, occur at the same time. Is that clear? So those are the simple things to think about. Uh, let's see. Ta -ta -ta. So this is just the name of the ISR. And then, how do you actually pass in arguments to the ISR? Use this concept of a context, okay? Uh, so I, this is the fourth argument. The fifth argument, like I mentioned in last lecture, is reserved. So just put that as zero. Put that as zero, okay? So, oops. Hex zero, right? So let's look at this context. So what you have to do is you basically have to create A context, all right? So it's a structure. It and inside the structure, you can pretty much give anything, right? In other words, this structure is the argument that you pass to your ISR. Is that clear? So what I decided to pass, because what I want to do is I want to make characters fall at two coordinates per second, all right? Two y coordinates per second. So I trigger this guy. Uh, well, this guy, this, sorry, this ISR is triggered every millisecond. So within there, I wait for 500 counts. Make sense? So what what information do I need to pass? Let's see what I've decided to pass. I've decided to basically pass uh, the base address of your timer. Right? This is always a good thing to pass into your ISR. Okay? If you think about it, this base address. In this case, the base address of the timer. The second argument I decided to pass in, which is very specific to this ISR, is the pointer to the character buffer memory location. Because I want to write to the screen, yes? So what you could do is you could, you could potentially get away without not passing this in. That is the base address of the timer. But actually, for the timer ISR, this is very important. Because remember I told you, one of the things about the timer is you have to manually clear it okay, within the ISR. So for that, you do need the base address. So in the case of this ISR, you definitely need this. And for this application, writing to the screen, I decided to pass in the pointer, which points to the memory address of my um, VGA controller. Okay. So what I now do is this is a global variable. Okay. I also have a couple of uh, other global variables. My Y position, because my ISR is going to access this, and n ticks is the number of ticks. Okay. So within my ISR, I increment n tick, assuming it's properly initialized. When the number of ticks is equal to 500, I update the Y position. Is that clear? I mean, you could ask, can I get away without global variables? If you're really careful about the use of static int, what is static mean? What's the static keyword? Correct. So in between function calls, so let's look at this. So static C keyword, and I don't expect you to remember this in this uh, sense. Uh, let's see. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually, no, it's here. Mm -hmm. Size off. So I don't expect you to remember this, but just look it up. So here's static. Yeah, so preserves variable value to survive after its scope ends. So the value of the variable is retained between function calls, but I am not, I really didn't want to take a risk with the ISR. Okay, so an ISR is a special kind of function. I just um, use the general like uh, rule of thumb that if you want to use interrupts it's it, i mean global variables are not good but they're not bad either right so in the sense in a in a regular context of functions you don't want to use global variables right? because you don't know what will modify them but anyway so having declared this uh, global structure i instantiate within my main 
well, I don't want to say instantiate, I declare a uh, context variable. And within this timer ISR context, I basically use the dot operator, okay, to instantiate, I mean, not to, to set my timer base. Again, this you can find from system.h. And this character buffer points to my character VGA buffer, okay, which I opened. Actually, I'm sorry, it doesn't point. This is the pointer, okay. This is just an entry in this structure. Is that clear? I could have done this. Let's say you want to make a pointer, which is not necessary. I could do this. Then how would I change this? How would this change? Huh? Uh, no, it's not the ampersand. Almost right. So it's this one, remember? Uh, the pointer to a structure. If you haven't done this before, that's fine. Now you're doing this, okay? So remember this. Uh, you don't need to make it a pointer. There's no reason to make it a pointer. Then what I do is once I initialize the context, I pass in this context, okay? So as the fourth argument. So if you look at the syntax for this function, basically you need to pass in a pointer. So I give, basically you need to pass in a memory location. So now, like Connor said, I use the ampersand to get the address of this variable. But I need to typecast it to a void pointer because that's the argument this function expects, a void pointer. So that's it. I have registered my ISR. Okay? Registered the ISR function, um, passed in the appropriate arguments, and I'm ready to go. Okay? Any questions on this? Okay, registered. Step one is done. Step two is you enable the IRQ. So you give it the interrupt controller ID and then the name of the IRQ, call this function, you're done. It's enabled, right? So after this step here, line 78, your interrupt is going to get triggered or this function is going to get called every millisecond. Okay, let's look at the function. So the function is basically, it should always, it should not return anything, right? If you want to return some arguments, you can use this context pointer, okay? Because it's a pointer, right? So it points to a memory location. You change some uh, entries, you're basically going to be changing, like it's like returning a value, right? So what do I do? Within this uh, function, ISR, I declare a lo local context, okay? So I can easily access this. Um, argument passed in. I basically take in my argument, retype cast it, if you will, to the correct type, basically this fellow, yes. And then I check, all right? So if n tick is less than this update y coordinate rate, which I have declared up here as 500, okay? Remember, n tick is a global variable, all right? So every millisecond, I check. If it's less than or equal to I have not reached 500, I keep incrementing it, all right? I wait till I hit 500 counts. So to be accurate, now I think about it, this should be less than, okay, because I started zero. I have properly initialized my n tick and y pass in my main function before I register and enable my ISR. So I go zero through 499, total of 500 counts. So once I'm equal to 500, okay, I go here into this else branch, and what do I do? I make sure to reset n tick to zero, and I check where is my y. Am I, am I have I gone through the entire? It's 80 by 60. Remember all the rows. If I have, I clear that line. Notice now I can access my char buffer, but since this context basically is a pointer to this context, which is the argument passed in, I'm basically affecting this fellow. Make sense? Advantage of using pointers. All right. So I clear the current line. I set it to zero again. If not, what I do is I clear the current line. I increment my y position by two, and I redisplay. OK? So either I clear and start over, or I clear and I redisplay, right? With y coordinate incremented by two, since I call this every 500 counts of the one millisecond clock, right? So that should be two hertz, okay, or half a second. 
So it looks like it's falling at two y coordinates per second because I increment by two. And then finally, this is very important. I didn't do this the first time. So last week when I was designing this thing and my count was way off, right? It was moving on the screen, but it was just like all over the place. So you need to clear the timer overflow flag. That's what this is. So this is how you do memory mapped IO. Use this function called IO read write. You go to the timer base, you go to the st status register offset, which is basically zero, okay, offset zero. From that memory location, you just write a zero. This will re-enable the interrupt again by clearing the TO flag, so that's it, okay. All right, any questions on this? Okay, so what I recommend you guys do is, like I said, today's lecture is gonna be very short. So what I recommend you guys do now is uh, try to uh, you implement this on the DE one. I already gave you the software. So when you download, um, basically, uh, let's see. So we go to digital systems design. So 3921, weeks four and five. So here it is, the interrupt, all right? So download this, what you will, and if you unzip it, you'll basically get the hardware is done, all right? So look at it. It also includes the um, hardware abstraction layer for the VGA driver, the character buffer, like we discussed last week. But it also has a software folder. So first, look at this software folder. I would recommend you copy this main file outside this software folder, let's say to your desktop, print it out, right, and study it. Create a new Eclipse project. Type in this main.c, and then run it, and make sure that you see falling at two y coordinates per second. That'll be, a, that'll be a very good start on your project, okay? Because on in almost all of your projects, if not all your projects, you have to use the interrupts of one form or the other, okay? So that's about it for today's lecture. So uh, next lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to get into the SD card interface, right? And yeah, we'll do SD card. And then I might, uh, let's look at the schedule. This week, I know we have an SD card. I don't know what we have next week. I think we might have time enclosure. Let's see. Looks like it's not opening up. Slow, slow, slow. So we have time. Let me save this on the desktop. Let's do this. Oh, there it is. Super. Okay. So week six. Yeah, we'll look at uh, SD card interfacing next two lectures. And then, I don't know, I may not do the ADA interfacing. I was planning to bring in the um, external ADA, like a board, right? And then show you how to interface to it. I may not do this because uh, all those of you who are doing the ADA are using the audio codec ADA. So I might talk about that. We'll see. I'll, I might, I'll, I'll think about what to talk about. I might, instead of doing the ADA, I might talk about the university program PS2 interface, okay? Because that will be more useful to all of you because all your projects pretty much involve that. So we'll see. But yeah, this week we continue working on lab three, but this uh, the lab three, recall that you have to display the amount of time the program has been running, all right? If you look at the timer routines, all right, in the NIOS2 software developers handbook, uh, basically you have functions which do that, but you could also use interrupts. So what I mean is, and ah, it's slow. That's booting up. So this week you continue working on lab three. Lab three checkout was only next week, but I I would recommend you start on the project this week. Right? All of your proposals are good, so start working on it because all of this lab three, this reference design we discussed, the SD card we're going to discuss, they all kind of reinforce the main ideas behind digital systems design. Right? So let's look at how you would do lab three if you're just going to use the timer module. Too much. This is interrupt controllers. See software developers handbook. Yeah, 
right, here it is. Hardware abstraction layer. So there is basically in the timer devices, blah, 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 system clock driver. So you have functions such as get time of day, set time of day, times, all right? So for a, basically, you could use, for example, the alter antics function. It tells you the current value of the system clock. So it's possible you can do this without an interrupt. But again, there are many options to do lab three, right? Basically, we give a display on the seven segment display how long your program has been running, not how long your hardware has been downloaded, right? So once you download your program, and that's not really a big deal because all these functions, they start executing only after your program is downloaded, right? So yeah, it's... You could, for example, have a timer that's running every second. So that is, the period is one second and you could trigger an interrupt, right? That's one easy way to do it, right? Very, very simple way. Or you could, that is you could reuse the same reference design and appropriately modify it. You could even display how long your program has been running actually on the VGA display, right? You just have to modify this. Yeah, so that's about it, and I'll see you next lecture.